Considering what people get up to around the world, playing music is one of the most beautiful things, and you, know, you should never be taken to task for it, no matter what your technique. And uh, everybody's voice is valuable. Hey, Jared here from SoundGuitarLessons.com, where I teach on a wide variety of guitar topics and go super, super deep into some music concepts so we can just become better musicians and express ourselves more freely. I talk about jazz guitar, improvisation, music theory, technique, all kinds of things. Classical guitar is also a big part of my guitar background, and this video is the final video in a series I've been doing about my transition and journey into playing classical guitar without nails, which is pretty unorthodox for the world of classical guitar. This video is something that is very different than anything I've done before. It's a full hour-long interview with another guitarist, teacher, YouTuber. His name is Rob McKillop. I reached out to him because he specializes in playing classical guitar without nails, and he's been writing about it and talking about it for years and years. Rob is a shining example of someone being himself as a musician, as an artist, and that is one of his main messages, is to help other people do their own thing, find their own voice, and our conversation goes into that and many other directions as well. So I hope you find it helpful and or inspiring. If you're someone that struggles with finding your own path in music, what to work on, what kind of artist you want to be, what to practice, what's the right way to do things, what's the wrong way to do things, if these are challenges for you, then this conversation should be quite helpful and if you're interested at all in classical guitar, and especially classical guitar without nails, then this should also be very beneficial. So I hope you enjoy. Thanks so much. The first thing I want to say is just, and I want everyone to hear it too, is just thank you so much for being so generous with your time because um, we uh, did this once already. So this is, we kind of did it, I guess we could think of it as a dress rehearsal now, but we had an amazing conversation and I um, I enjoyed it so much. We talked about so much great stuff, and uh, we had a technical issue where we were not able to use a bunch of the audio from it. So we're doing round two. So Rob, thank you so much. The main reason I reached out to you is because of your expertise and, and knowledge about playing classical guitar without nails. And you've been, I think, a, as a big influence on a lot of people uh, by being someone who's been posting online about that topic for a long time. So. Um, I think a lot of people appreciate that that you've been a voice um, in that world. If someone's looking around online, hey, is this a is this possible? Am I is this possible at all? Um, you're someone that comes up and you have all this research on it and everything. Um, before we talk about that specifically, because because I I, do, I think it's increasingly a topic of interest uh, for people. I just wanted to say your last couple of videos you posted were your performance videos were just gorgeous and I, I just, they're, they're absolutely lovely. And I wanted to ask you as a musician, as a teacher, you know, as you're in, in terms of your projects that you're putting music out there, this is unrelated to specifically the uh, playing without nails topic, but I'm just curious um, for you, cause I know you, you're a teacher and you're posting educational content, you're teaching private lessons, you're doing a lot of that kind of stuff. You're posting, you know, articles on things, and then you're just posting these performances. Um, when you first started putting stuff online, were you thinking of it as, I'm, I'm a musician, I'm putting performances out there, or were you f doing it as a teacher, or has it has it always been combined for you? And as kind of a follow-up to that, these days, is that a pretty important part of your outlet? Do you see it as kind of, is that the end to a certain, you know, you study a new piece and you end up doing a little performance. I'd love to hear about that because I've just been putting mostly teaching stuff online, but I feel like for everybody, and I tell this to my students, having some kind of outlet, I mean, it's why students have done recitals forever, right? It's pretty important. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Okay, well, thanks. Uh, thanks for asking me, first off. You know, I love your channel. And I'm not just saying that. Guests tend to say that kind of thing, but I really mean it. It's a fantastic channel. But moving on, Thank enough you. about you. <laughs> Um, yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, I had a, a concert career uh, for 20 odd years and um, it, quite frankly I got tired of it and um, it's a hard, hard job uh, traveling uh, solo, you know, it's, um, and I decided to uh, take a job in a library just stacking shelves just to clear my head a bit because it was all getting a bit much. And 
of course, I started getting interested in the guitar again because I've been playing lute professionally uh, and theorbo and all this stuff, playing in ensembles, playing solos, playing with singers and so on. And uh, suddenly I had nothing to do, no concerts, no recordings, no broadcasts. What am I going to do You know, when I play? So I, um, the, you know, I got into the classical guitar again at that time after having played the lute for 20 years. And uh, I had this no-nails technique from playing the lute. Uh, but lute technique doesn't lend itself totally to a classical guitar, so I adapted and you know, ended up with the technique I had now. But I needed, I needed some kind of uh, outlet for this. Um, I had uh, a couple of videos I put online. This is about 13, 14 years ago. And, um, you know, people were getting interested, but there weren't many guitar players doing it at that time. Um, and I, I had my last concert to do and, uh, I advertised this concert and keep in mind that I'd had three number one albums in the Scottish classical music chart. And oh, wow. I thought, Congrats. yeah, and I, I'm not just saying that. The, the point is that you think I would get a crowd coming in. There were six <laughs> people, six people. <laughs> so, and uh, like yeah, <laughs> uh, it was a uh, you know difficult. And then I I put a video online before I left the house. And when I came home, it had about 400 plays on. It. And I suddenly realised there's my audience. You know, this is my theatre, my arena, and. Um, so that started me uh, putting up regular videos. Um, YouTube tells me actually, I thought I'd done about 300. They told me it's 550 or something. So it was just embarrassing the amount of videos that are out there. Um, Fantastic. Yeah, it's ridiculous. So it um, that was how I started making the videos. And a lot of them were, uh, you know, if you're on a forum, someone asks something and you do something and it, you know, it's a, it's a video. Um, so I wasn't really thinking of a big audience. Um, now, I think at the moment I've got 18,000 subscribers, which for me is like 18,000 more than I thought I'd be getting, you know. <laughs> and I know there's a lot of people who got a lot more than that and a lot have fewer than that. And you've got to just, ignore all that you know it's you know it's, it's utterly meaningless <laughs> and uh and i know you you're trying to build up a channel but i i'm almost anti doing that and I'm, I'm i'm not you know saying you know subscribe and i mean i don't yeah. you know i don't say you shouldn't do that but it, it's it was an output for me rather than um anyone else i mean that sounds a bit odd selfish but um, I liked having somewhere to go that would be an end product of learning a piece or a technique or something that I was doing that I could put this out there and then I could move on. And uh, over time, uh, it's grown an audience and, and people like what I do, but uh, I'm not trying to uh, build it up. It, it just sure. it is what it is and you know people come and listen and uh, I love the comments and uh, that kind of thing it's, it's, it's a nice little community and you're, yes. you're getting a great community now so yeah. uh, I read the comments oh, I, I think so, so yeah I, I think that's wonderful advice and it's one of the things I just love about how you operate all around and it seems to come as a natural part of your personality too the little clip I posted on my channel which of course I'll link to that in in this one is similar for your sound on the guitar you know you're saying find your voice and and ignore uh whether or not you should or shouldn't be doing this or that and and I think you're saying the same thing for your channel and i i i appreciate that and also one of the one of the things i love about talking to you is that, that we do have um some differences in in how we operate and um and i find it to be refreshing uh to hear your take on things including how you practice and Last time you said you'd ever practice if you're not um, inspired to, which is a little different than. So it's nice to have different different takes on these things. Just to switch it over to the the student for a second, do you advise your students and um, guitarists in general to have an outlet in that in, in some kind of way? Because it it is 
it is so helpful to have an end point and then to be able to move on, like you just said. And it can just feel like it can really get to the point of endless kind of working on the same thing over and over and, and wondering what's the point if you don't have a little bit of an arrival point somewhere as an as an artist. Yeah, no, that's absolutely important. And um, when I was before COVID hit, um, nearly all my students would come to my house. Yeah, now everybody's on Zoom. And uh, once every uh, three months, I would hire a hall, a local church hall or something, and uh, they'd all meet, and you know, because they never meet each other, they just come to my house individually, and uh, they would meet once every three months. And over time, you know, some of my students have been with me for nearly ten years. They they would get to know each other, and they would have uh, some somewhere they would work their repertoire up for to give a little performance and they might be shaking all the way through some of them poor oh. things but every one of them even those who were shaking loved it and they wanted to do it again now things are different um uh, you know i don't have any students come to the house now everyone's yeah. on zoom and it, it's lost that little bit of community but i do encourage the students who are all over the world to to find something similar, some local group where you can go and you don't have to be an expert, you can be a complete beginner. Um, I started the uh, Scottish Lute and Early Guitar Society uh, just over 10 years ago and it's just, you know, just had its 10th anniversary where I resigned and retired from it rather and uh, but it's still going. And the reason for that was, you know, there's no professional lute players in Scotland, maybe one or two who are semi-professional. Um, most people are amateurs and, and beginners. And so it created this place they come to again every three months. And that's still, you know, it's been going 10 years and still going. So I think I it's see. important to, to if, if nothing exists, for you then try and get a few people together and create it yeah. agreed agreed yeah and i think kind of having an end product and and being able to share it with someone is one thing uh, and vi and video is great but nothing replaces the in-person community and no, of no, course COVID no, makes no. that you could be a complete beginner playing uh, the simplest study but you'll be surrounded by people who are uh, you'll give you the most applause you know so Yes. It's, it's a great feeling. Right, right. Well, thanks for, for sharing your thoughts on that. That's that's um, that's helpful to hear and hopefully helpful for others as well. Let's um, let's dive into the, the no nails topic. Um, and firstly, if you and I know you've probably talked about this over and over again, you've written about it, you have videos about it. But if you could, for the listener and, and viewer right now, give a little bit, since you're so knowledgeable about this, give a little bit of the history of of no nail playing and and then your relationship uh to it as well and how how that's become kind of one of one of the things at least that you're known for well of course when people were playing lutes um there were nail players but very few most people played without nails uh, we believe in the old days but not everyone some people played with nails um and then uh, moving into the classical period you can compare saw with aguado they both lived in the same hotel in Paris at the same time, and both uh, expats from Spain. And uh, they were good friends, and they had completely opposite techniques. Uh, Saur couldn't abide nail playing, uh, whereas um, Aguado liked it. And um, they played duets, and you know, the other parts are Mark, Saur, and Aguado. So, you know, it's. Uh, the point is that nail playing and no nail playing have, have coexisted uh, since the start of the, the guitar, really. And um, during, um, well, let's look at Francisco Tarraga, uh, one of the greatest names in classical guitar. Uh, he was a nail player, but he saw um, Arcas, um, one of the predecessors of, of Tariga playing Spanish popular music and Arcas was a no-nail player and uh, late on in, in um, Tariga's life um, there were two uh, um, contradictory 
um, descriptions of how he came to know nail playing. Uh, one is by his student, Pachol, Emilio Pachol, who wrote a four or five volume um, a method book based on Tarraga principles. And um, he said Tarraga just, uh, just liked the sound of it, maybe broke a nail or something and developed it. And three months later, he was doing concerts. Uh, you know, that was very quick. This is way later in his career. Yeah, late in his career. And, um, and then the contradictory view is that he had some uh, medical ailment that caused him to have to play without nails. However, um, some of his students um, described going to meet him for the first lesson. And the very first thing he'd do, he'd get out his, his scissors and his nail file and says, let's get rid of the nails. And he absolutely insisted uh, that they play without nails. So he really was won over to it towards the end of his career. And we, you know, we'll probably get onto this later, the tremolo question. Um, well, yeah, he... In go this, for it now, yeah. <laughs> In this tour he did, which was one of his last tours, uh, it was in Italy. Um, we know the program that he was playing tremolo pieces, and uh, the reviews are ecstatic, you know, so it, you know, it's possible. More on that later. So there was Tarraga at, this, in, at the end of his career getting into it. But then Segovia came along and he started playing in two, three, four thousand seater halls without amplification. And he felt he needed the nail just to give a little bit of edge to cut through to the back row. Uh, having be seen Segovia play in a, in a three thousand seater hall sitting near the back, it doesn't cut through that much. You know? <laughs> well, I would use an amplifier. Sorry? You, you, you saw him play, you say? Yeah, yeah. Oh, he was. Wow. Uh, he came to Scotland twice when I was uh, learning classical guitar. And um, uh, he was one late 80s and one early 90s, I think. Wow. And um, yeah, it was an incredible experience because, you know, here's God you know, on yes. stage. <laughs> He's just got this aura about him. And of course, you, mm. you'd been listening and reading all, all the literature about him and suddenly there he was of course his playing wasn't anything like it was in his 50s you know but uh there were moments where you go wow what was that and it was just an, an incredible phrase that just unwrapped uh, you and uh yeah. but he became hugely famous segovia and uh people copied him quite naturally and uh he was a uh, very vociferous but there's only one way to play and that's segovia's way and uh, so everyone was learning that way. So n no nail playing kind of dropped off a bit, but not completely. And uh, on my website, which is my initials, rmclassicalguitar.com, um, you can oh, find, awesome. yeah, there's a page called Players. And uh, I list some of the players uh, since Tariga's time. Uh, who played, you know, concerts, made recordings and so on, uh, classical guitar without nails. And it's coexisted. And what I'm doing is nothing new. So um, I just, I came, remember, from playing lute uh, yeah. back to guitar. Initially I was playing nails with nails on guitar, but after playing lute for 20 years, I was mm. really in touch with the string. I mean, it's, it's a tactile thing. Um, it's amazing, yeah. Yeah, um, we can get into the technique in a minute. We'll get into the technique too, yeah. But that's just fantastic to hear your perspective on that. Um, two things: one, I, when I first started playing guitar, I fell in love with the Bach lute suite recordings of a lutenist that I don't know if you know of his name, um, Eduardo, and I don't know how to pronounce his last name exactly, Aguez. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Aguez? Yeah, he's Aguez. phenomenal. Oh, oh my gosh, the the E major lute suite, I would just listen to it and be completely mesmerized. And that was when, and I was already a guitarist and kind of switching over to, or not switching over, but adopting uh, playing classical guitar. Prior to that, I was, you know, playing rock bands and stuff like that. But yeah. I was absolutely hooked. And, um, I'm quite sure that was without his technique was without nails and it just was a bit slower than a lot of people play the lute suite on the guitar. It was just warmer. It was ethereal. It was just captivating. And anyway, now that I've, you know, really been 
switching over here, I'm getting a little bit of that same aesthetic sense. You know, as I play it, I'm like, oh, this is the sound that 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 I first that I first fell in love with. Yeah, and uh, Pujol calls it organic and uh, uh, ethereal. You know, and uh, it's it's a different thing, and you might like it, you might not like it, and uh, the, th the thing is, you don't have to do one or the other. It's, you do what you like. That's the, the whole point. But uh, yeah, so lute technique is is close to what I'm doing now. I've kind of uh, taken fifty percent lute technique, um, maybe ten percent saw, ten percent tariga, and and. Uh, mm. Uh, the rest, uh, my own developments. Um, so it's not exactly look technique I'm doing, but uh, so, so many questions to jump off from that because I would love to hear we you know, what is that loot technique that you know that you're saying you're doing differently, and and also just while I'm thinking of it, I'm starting to find that when I first started doing this, I really felt like oh the volume is such a factor, but now that I'm getting further along, I'm starting to feel like the volume is. It's actually quite possible to pro to project quite well. Well, remember Sor and Aguado, no nails, yeah. nails were playing together duets. Um, it's certainly possible. I, I played in ensembles with three or four guitars, and no one's ever complained about the volume level. Um, yeah. So, if you, the thing is, if you break a nail, if you're a nail player, and you break a nail, and you play a note with that broken nail finger. It sounds awful, and you quite rightly might assume that um, no nail playing is terrible, it's not for me. I get a much nicer sound with my nails. One of the problems is you're still using the same technique, you know, and uh, it's at a disadvantage with your regular technique, you have to learn a new technique. Um, the good news is that it's uh, a very easy technique to, to learn, and actually I'm um, there's more than one technique, you know, just yes. in the same way there's more than one way of playing with nails. There's yes. more than one way of playing without nails. But you can develop a technique. And the pads of your fingers, the first six months are absolutely crucial. Um, and what I do is I urge students to tune down a whole tone. So you've got D on the first string, mm -hmm. D, A, F and so on. And uh, just pretend it's still in E, B, G, you know, just pretend it's normal guitar tuning but it's down a tone and this uh, gives you a really low tension and uh, you're able to work the string more and uh, you can really feel the contact developing in your fingertips and that's really important it, it, you got to condition them um, yes. you know you get a beautiful sound and it's uh, yes it's softish and uh, uh, there are limitations on it, I'll admit it. I mean, I don't get as wide a, a tonal palette as Julian Bream when he goes really ponticello and contrasting with really mellow. Uh, so I've got a more limited um, color palette, but it's more than enough for, for the, what I want to express on the instrument. Uh, if I was looking for extremes, then I might go back to nail playing, but I'm not really... Do you always play with the whole step down? Is that your D? I know, I w I know you you also like to change the tuning day by day, guitar by guitar, and maybe you can speak to that a little too. But if if there was kind of default for you, do you tend to be that whole step down, or is it all over the place? Uh, well, uh, I, you know, I'm making my living by teaching online and and Zoom, and so we have to come to some uh, agreement, me and the student. Now, usually students turn up at 4.40, and uh, if anything, I will i don't tend to go higher than 4.15, so I might use a, a, a capo or capo, as you say in America, and, uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> um, at first. But I'll, I'll encourage the student, if they're trying to play without nails, to, to tune down. And so we agree on either um, uh, 392, which is a tone down, D on the first string, or 415, which is E flat, and and uh, once they've decided, I'm happy to go to either one. Um, my strings are quite used to moving between the two now and settles in minutes. Um, I find gut strings are great for keeping tuning, um, but you have to, um, um, uh, you know, make sure that every day you tune them down a little bit. 
well, when, every night, rather, when you go to bed, yeah, because they oh, can... You don't keep the tension where yeah. they're at, tune them Yeah, oh, okay. tune them down. And uh, it only takes uh, five minutes for them to settle when you tune back up. Um, Do you pull them down just so, is that make the strings last longer, or yeah. is it pulling too much tension on the instrument, or...? Well, no, the, the tension's not too big, and I, uh, I just like to get value for money, so... Uh, yeah, especially the especially the first string. If you only want to tune one string down, it should be the first string tuned down a tone, even when you've already been down a tone overnight, mm-hmm. and that'll help the longevity of the string. Um, prior to this, the strings I had on had been on for uh, about 18 months. Um, you know, it's a long time, yeah. even the first string. <laughs> yeah. Um, these I, I, I wait a long time between strings myself as well. Yeah. Yeah. These bass These strings are, are uh, two years old. <laughs> nice. A couple questions about the strings. With, with nylon strings, would you tune them down and they lasted longer as well? I've never done that, but is, or it, was that only coming into play once you're switching to gut strings? Well, you, you, most of my students don't play them gut strings. You know, they, uh, they, they think they're too expensive, but when they consider I had them on for 18 months, you know, it's not that expensive. And um, there are different companies. At the moment, I use a company called Wild Gut Strings. They're in Switzerland. Uh, okay. Worth a look at their website, wildgutstrings.ch. Um, okay. And they are the most um, natural, simple uh, gut strings. A lot of companies process make, process them. Uh, I try to avoid um, varnished strings. Um, they're really for nail players. So if you're a nail player and want to explore gut uh, as a medium, uh, then go for varnished. Um, but if you're playing without nails, then I think personally un- unvarnished is, is better. Can you explain uh, the difference that you feel the gut strings, uh, what what they provide for you as as an O'Neill player? Just the experience, you know, what's different? Is it tone? Is it texture? Is it everything? Is everything? Yeah, is well, just, tone, texture, and everything. Yeah, yeah. I haven't I haven't gone there yet. I'm using the Nile gut, which I'm not, you know, am, amazed with. It honestly just feels the same as when I was using nylon. Also, I tuned down. Um, you know, because I hear you're playing, and it, it is it is so refreshing. I have to say to hear because we're so used to the guitar being tuned the four four. It's just like, especially years of playing that way and listening. It's just and all the repertoire being that way. It it is amazingly refreshing to have that lower pitch. So I love I love listening to your your playing for that reason. I tuned down yesterday uh, down to a uh, whole step down, and it was I ended up tuning back because. I was working on just repertoire that I had been playing, you know, daily for for a bit, and it just just the the key change felt too weird to me. But but the feel and the and the range was amazing. I'll have to start a new piece that I'm you know <laughs> haven't imprinted the. Yeah, the sure, that's fair enough. I mean, nylon strings tune them down a tone. It's, it's not the same as tuning down gut strings, uh-huh. and uh, uh-huh. okay. but it's a start. And the, remember, the main thing initially for tuning down is to condition your finger pads with a no, lo- much lower, lower tension. tension. Okay. So you don't want to um, uh, you know get uh, calluses. Um, I use uh, you know a little balm. Uh, okay. Uh, this is great. I was going to ask you about this because at first. I feel like the tone is so, you know, n- nice and, and warm and soft. And then as the calluses start to get in there, it's it's not a good sound. It's great. <laughs> no, this is uh, one my wife made me. She makes bombs. It is St. John's wort or something, which apparently repairs cracks in the skin and so on. Uh, uh, I, yeah. yeah, it's worth thinking about. And I just put a tiny little bit on. I just dip one finger in and, and uh, just spread it around. It's so little the amount. It's it's almost like you know, nothing there. But it's it's um, it's it's a bit like you see players using oils on their forehead or side of their nose before they're playing. A classical yes. guitarist, you often see them do this before they start. Yes. Um, it's a bit like that. It's just a little bit of oil uh, on okay. the, on the skin. Um, yeah. But definitely before I start playing, and definitely afterwards, and if I'm playing for a long time, I might you know do it in between. Um, 
but yeah. it's gut strings if you've never played them uh, have a slightly rough feel and um, you might be a bit worried about that if you've been playing these highly polished nylon strings but that sounds appealing to me the grip yeah the attraction yeah. you know yeah. so the fingers yeah. really feel the strings i, I mentioned um, you know this is is a tactile technique much more tactile yeah. than playing with nails and most people play with a combination of nail and flesh uh, but when you've got right. just flesh, uh, that that feeling of uh, being on the string with the string, you know, you know working yeah. the string, um, is really important, and uh, you get that. Well, let's talk about the technique for a second. Um, and uh, I'd still love to hear about, you know, how that what that original lute technique was that you're talking about, and then kind of just any kind of technique stuff that you're that how you approach it now. You know, now that I'm posting stuff online about this topic, someone commented the other day and said, I can't remember what players they said. They listed a few players. They said some people will anchor their pinky, which of course a lot of guitarists of all genres do that. And and they said um, for some of the no nail players that were doing that, I don't know if you know anything about that, but I'm certainly kind of just exploring everything I can and finding my own way and again influenced by some of your advice but the kind of playing underneath a little bit this is such a different angle than we're trained you know to play with the nails and that's and it's just you know i'm finding wow where where does it get the best tone same with tremolo too because i've been experimenting with that and i haven't settled on something yet but there there are as you said n there's no right way there's no one way oh where to start it's <laughs> um I look technique first of all. I mean, because uh, using flesh and all the fingers, the thumb can actually come over to the first string, which you rarely do in, in standard classical technique. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, and you know, alternating thumb index for runs, um, yes. you know, that kind of thing. And now there's a reason for that. Is uh, if you play a C major scale, say the first five or six notes. The thumb is playing uh, stronger beats, so um, in loop technique you reserve the index finger uh, for uh, weak beats. I say C major, of course I'm down a tone. So. You're yeah, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, thumb is strong, index is weak. And uh, so on the down beats uh, you get the strong finger, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak. Now if we look at the notes that are strong, it's the, it's the arpeggio, try it. And what's happening when you play a scale, you're accenting the triad. And so there are chords hidden within scales. Um, you know, we tend to think of scales as just running up and down a scale, but it, there are chords hidden in there. Uh, the second, uh, the weak notes, D, F and A, D minor or you know, fancifully a G9 or something could be the sort of tonic and dominant or chord one and two. Um, so you get in this little shadow of a chord underneath. So it's very important to loop playing in the Renaissance period to uh, develop this strong weak idea. In the Baroque, when it came to big German 13 course lutes, there's so many strings. Quite frankly, you're just happy to get any finger on the note. <laughs> so that idea of uh, thumb index went out the window a bit there. The thumb was too busy on the bass strings. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I took a little bit of that uh, early, you know, Italian um, Renaissance technique into my playing. So I still use thumb index. I once did the Rodrigo concerto, uh, doing all the fast runs in thumb index. That uh, was a long time ago. I'm not going to embarrass myself with it now, but I <laughs> can't remember them anyway. But yeah, yeah, you can get quite fast with thumb index. The pinky on the soundboard, uh, it's there, but it's kind of floating and it very often comes off. Yeah, you know, you'll okay. see some of my videos. and uh, You're not anchoring it. No, it's almost accidental it touches it. Yeah, you know, it's, it's just like, because of that angle. Yeah, yeah I, gotcha. I collapse this side of the hand down. And uh, right. this way, rather than this. I mean, yes. w if you lift your hand up to the guitar, you don't normally do that. You know, just lifting <laughs> right. your hand up, <laughs> you know, right. just bringing your hand up. It's it is better. For, yeah, it's better on the this this part of the wrist would get some uh, 
some tension and issues when I played with that technique. This is very natural, comfortable, yeah. It takes a bit of getting used to it. You know, give yourself time if you're going to take it out, at least six months with low tension, uh, just playing slowly and simply. And, and let's just repeat that because uh, it's one of my kind of main messages is like just being patient with the results that we're wanting at least six months. Six months is a great range for, I think, I kind of keep that in mind for practicing anything new. I'm like, yeah. th anything new really six months from now is when I should think that it's actually a part of my, you know, mu musicianship as opposed to in two weeks. <laughs> Why don't I have this down or whatever? And so for me, it's been a year now since I started playing this way. And I'm only just now starting to feel like I could, you know, maybe do a performance or, but also it's not my main focus, which I want to, you know, I want to ask you about your many focuses as well and how you balance those things. Cause you have a great perspective on that, but it's not my main focus. So I'm not a hundred percent only doing this, but, but it's been about a year of, of, you know, chipping away at it. And I'm, and I'm very pleased with, with the, the slow kind of long game progress. Cause it's the opposite of easy. It's opposite of easy come, easy go, right? If it comes slowly, it's not going to not going to go. It's away nice slowly. to take your time with things. If you don't have commitments at concerts, then you can try this out. Uh, what's the harm in it? You can always grow your nails again. You know, if you don't like it. Um, right. It took me six months to start feeling I was really getting somewhere, and about well, maybe two years before I knew for sure I would never go back. You know, that uh, it gave me everything I needed gotcha. in all the different repertoires I was playing. I could find a way of yeah. playing them this way. And I was much yeah. happier, more relaxed. Great to hear. Two years. Took you two. Because that's, yeah, I'm feeling the same. Yeah, it takes a while to start to, it takes a while to find your voice and your, your approach. And yeah. it just, it there's no shortcut for that kind of thing. You know, quick, right. quick side note here, just in, on the overall topic that I just wanted to say and, and ask you, if, if you agree with this, because 20 years ago when I started playing classical guitar at the very, very beginning, it really, really felt like playing without nails was, was, and of course, like you said, it's always been there. There's a history of it and people kind of knew it. People kind of knew that, that at some point people did that, but it really felt like that is not okay and not the way you're ever supposed to do it. And that's a little bit how I'm approaching, you know, the way I'm talking about it on my channel, but, but I'm getting a little bit of, um, a little bit of pushback, not in a negative way, really, but but a lot of people, I think, now, just because of the internet, I guess, a lot of people are accepting it more and saying, "Why are you talking about it this way? It's pretty normal that you know that people do." Some people seem to believe that, oh, that's that's pretty normal. Whereas, kind of the experience I had was that um, you're not a real guitar player if you do that, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, I had that, and of course I was one of the first to talk about it online, yeah. it just happened to be that way, and I got a lot of uh, a flack for it, and people, teachers especially, writing to me, saying I was ruining their students, and uh, ruining potentially thousands of guitarists for life, you know, <laughs> and uh, well, if I have done, if I've ruined your life, I'm sorry, but uh, you but, can always... <laughs> so they found it. you online and they, they went to their teacher and said, hey, this person says it's okay, and their teacher is yeah, like, no. Yeah, teachers go, no, no, just don't listen to him, but you, you can't play that way, right. but he can. No, you can't, but he can. <laughs> That's why he's a freak. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right, right. <laughs> I think you've been, like you said, you were one of the first people talking about this online. I think you have been a big influence on this in, in, in just in the world, because like I said, it, it does feel like it's shifting now. And, and do you agree that it feels like it's shifting? Absolutely. And uh, I do get a lot of uh, mail from people saying how it changed their life. I mean, one of the most heartbreaking things, and I've had quite a number of uh, letters in the same vein, is somebody will say... I, I started 30 years ago and I couldn't have nails because of my job and the teacher said I'll never play classical guitar so I gave up and oh, now 30 years later I see your video and I'm in tears and yes. I'm, I'm going to buy a guitar at the weekend you know it's got, it gets my heart you know <laughs> me too it's painful oh I because I as a teacher you hear nightmare stories of, of teachers being saying anything discouraging or negative to a student is like the antithesis of what we're supposed to be doing. It's just, yeah. 
considering what people get up to around the world, playing music is one of the most beautiful things. And you, know, you should never be uh, you know, taken to task for it, no matter what your technique. You know, it's just your contribution. To and the you world, can do yeah. it any way you want to. If someone played with only their pinky yeah. and only their yeah. pinky, you could <laughs> you could still make. Well, beautiful, you know, Django you can still play beautiful Reinhardt. melodies. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Django yeah, Reinhardt. You find a way to make music. Find a way. Find a way. Um, yeah. Of course, one of the things about classical music is there are traditions uh, which they yes. value highly. This is the way to play the violin. This is the way to play the yes. cello. It's been settled. Just do it and that'll be it. Um, I, I would like there to be as many classical guitar techniques as there are players you know it's because we're living in an age when it's hard to differentiate between many of the, the players um, they all have a similar technique um, and yes. there are differences I'm not putting everyone down but there, there's a body of technique there that um, gives the same gloss on a lot of players and I would rather hear people who do things a little bit differently and bring something new to the to the yes. game. Yeah. You know, I just got a comment yesterday of someone saying, because uh, I just posted another in this series that this video will be a part of, and they were saying, you know, I noticed that all, most of the nail players sound the same to me, but every time I hear a no-nail player, they sound actually different than all the other no-nail players, which is what you're... And it's because you kind of have to find your way, and there's not that that kind of this is how you play um, convention, which I have to say is a blessing and a curse, I think, in classical music. In one way, you can make a lot of progress by using methodologies and, and uh, pedagogical approaches that have been tested, but then you also get into a box potentially. So it's... Well, look yeah. at uh, two of the greatest of the 20th century, John Williams and Julian Bream, and they played together duets and... Uh, it's a bit akin to uh, Sor Naguada when they were so different yeah. from each other. And uh, yet they're both nail players, but radically different techniques. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I would like to see more differences between players than yeah. commonalities, you know. So, But you have to have strength to do that, strength of purpose, you know. This is yes. what I feel, and this is what I envisage, and this is my approach. Um and you have to be willing to um, not sound the way you maybe think you want to for a while while you're finding it. I think that's the hardest part. Like you have to maybe, you know, quote unquote, sound bad to you feel like it's not there for while you're exploring that. And I think that is the hardest part. Also, just to speak of the, the different, um, the unique potential for each individual person having their sound. I think that that, being a part of one's journey in classical music, if, say if that was baked into a pedagogical approach, which it's not, where part of it is find, you know, how you want to sound and not sounding, I think it would make classical music in general far more appealing because, you know, it, people want to write their own songs because it's them. If you could have your own sound, it would be similar, like, oh, I could play this repertoire that I love, but also when I hear it on the recording, it's unmistakably has you in it. I mean, uh, a lot of people get discouraged because they, maybe their favorite player is David Russell, uh, amazing player, and, uh, um, it, it, you know, quite naturally people would want to sound a little bit like David if they're a fan of his playing. Sure. And yet when they play guitar, they don't sound like David. So maybe if I had his guitar and his strings and his nails, mm -hmm. right. then I would, but you wouldn't. You know, you could buy that guitar and buy those strings. You won't say anything like David Russell. Now, you either get discouraged or you say, actually, my voice is a bit different from David Russell's. And uh, everybody's voice, you know, is, is valuable and uh, unique and precious. And um, you need to find out what your voice is. Uh, sure. And no matter what it is, uh, if it sounds like someone else, it sounds like someone else. It, you know, it doesn't matter. It's your voice. And uh, if it sounds different from everyone else, fine. It sounds different. You know, just find your voice and uh, let that be your guide. <laughs> and that's what I've tried to do. But uh, yeah, it's, it's so hard. Simple. It's hard at times. Yeah. The fact that we're saying the word voice, if you think of the human voice, it's a lot easier to comprehend. Like you're not going to sound like 
David Bowie, even if you try, if you have a different voice than David Bowie. And so if you think of it similarly on the guitar, like you're going to have something that's a little more you. And, you know, you saying this, it, it's, oh, it's, it's just so wonderful, so inspiring. It's basically the clip that I put on my channel from our last interview, the little, the little snippet. And you just said, it is hard. Can, can you talk about that a little bit? Is, is, are there moments where it really was hard for you or do you, or has it, or or do you just acknowledge that it tends to be hard for people? Because you do seem to be uniquely um, strong about um, trying to ignore everyone else and be in your be in your own uh, individual voice kind of bubble in a beautiful way that that more people should do, if that makes sense. Uh, like everyone, you know, I went through the phase when you're you're younger of uh, trying to sound like the great players. And uh, I mentioned David Russell, who was a big hero of mine. I loved his playing. I saw him in concerts a few times, and I had uh, a couple of private lessons with him and uh, played in a master class uh, that he did. Mm. And, uh, you know, he's a great teacher and great communicator. So naturally, you get pulled into that. And uh, then I noticed that everyone else was also getting pulled into David's circle, and they were all trying to sound like David Russell, and no one was managing it. Uh, but they were didn't seem happy, you know, and, and I didn't yes. feel happy, and uh -huh. so I I I think it's I eventually gave up the guitar uh, to take up the lute because I couldn't see I couldn't hear myself in the guitar, uh -huh. you know, and I was playing with nails and um, I just didn't feel that I was being myself, and uh, then so I decided to leave that world and go into lute world because all my favorite guitar composers like Bach, <laughs> Robert De Vizzi, you know, and so on, uh, Weiss, they were, uh, they were uh, continual players and lute players and, you know, and so on, early music. Uh, so I decided to go down that route and by chance um, I, I just, well, I didn't discover them, but I discovered my, for myself these Scottish lute manuscripts, and uh, they were from around here where I live. And uh, it was beautiful music, so I, I started playing that a lot, and made a few albums and tours and so on. Um, and all the while I was beginning to tap into something deep that was, that was me, that um, I found my own way. I wasn't trying to be like any lute player. You know, because um, I I just mm. felt that uh, I had my own voice was coming through finally, and uh, I kind of found my own voice if you like. But one of the most important things you'll ever do is recognize your own voice. Mm. With all the noise that's going on, sometimes your own voice can get trampled on, and uh, if you recognize it, you say, "Well, hold on, that, I haven't heard that before, but it sounds natural, feels natural." This is my voice, and I'm very happy with it. Um, so I'm going to go down that avenue <laughs> and stop chasing uh -huh. these other players and techniques and styles and uh, just yeah. figure things out starting from this base, which is my my voice, if you like. And, my, yeah. Yeah. and uh, that's how that developed. And it, at first, it became very easy because... Um, I, I suddenly find myself doing concerts and recordings perfectly happy the way I was playing wow. in the knowledge that I wasn't playing like the great lute players, Nigel North and Jacob Lindbergh and others. I was wow. doing my own thing. And uh, I said, yeah, I'm just going to keep doing this. Which, you know, uh, if, you know, I've said it before, if, if you're not being yourself, who are you being? Yeah, that's a big yeah. question. So you have yeah. to, with, and I thought, well, I might, you know, some people won't like what I'm doing because I don't sound like the standard guys. Yeah. Um, but some people will, and it doesn't really matter if people don't or they do. Actually, equally, it, you know, and, and, and I say this with the deepest respect to all my subscribers and so on. It's, it's, it, I don't need them. <laughs> You know, I don't need that uh, confirmation all the time that what I'm doing is good. But I love hearing from them, and I love the fact that it moves them sometimes to tears and so on. It, you know, it's really, people get passionate about their music. Um, 
but you have to be strong enough to say, I'll do this even if no one's there. Yes, yes. That's maybe when you know you're on the right track. If you have that feeling of this is what I would be doing even if no one ever heard it. And 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 just to reiterate, it sounds like it really took you a while to find to find that. So and um and also from what you've said before, it sounds like also uh, the the music itself, when you're you know you, the score itself was helping you discover, as opposed to listening to someone you're inspired by, you know, like what who am I with you know with the music itself? I, uh, it's it's great if you if you come across a piece you've never heard anyone play, you know. That, there you go. That for me is a great delight. <laughs> Yes, because yes, then you're hearing yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is wonderful. You find this beautiful little shell on the beach, and it's, wow, no one's seen this shell before. Look how beautiful it is. And uh, right. the shell's my teacher. This score is going to be my teacher, how to play guitar. Right, right. And, of course, this could be applied to whatever someone's... It could be improvising or, obviously, any creative pursuit or, any, you know, these kinds of things. You know, for for me... I am really in the, I think, in the th thick of maybe, maybe the, the, I feel like something's coming around the corner, but I'm, I, I don't feel um, overall as a musician like I found my voice. I feel like with many individual things I like to do and play, I, I certainly have, but this leads me to at, to asking you about your balancing and juggling of of the many things you do, because part of part of your story is that you found your voice through going over to the lute, and to you know to some people, someone who's maybe you know hardcore dedicated, like no, I'm going to be a guitarist, or any kind of tunnel vision of of I'm going to I'm not going to digress from this because I'm so committed to this. Well, part of your story is that that's what helped you kind of get on the path of, of finding your voice. For me, I I you know struggle with. And it's a beautiful struggle because it's it's in uh, having a passion for many things. But I do, you know, a lot of jazz playing and a lot of uh, uh, improvising and arra arranging and songwriting, so many things. And individually, maybe feeling like, yeah, this is right. This is my voice. But and maybe they're never supposed to all combine. But um, but your thoughts on your many things. You play ukulele. You play lute. You play various types of lute. You play guitar. You play, you know, d different. Uh, eras and projects and yeah so thoughts on on kind of all of that yeah i mean the the, the, the glib thing i usually say it's all just music you know it doesn't matter what you do but Agreed. You know, it, it's yes it's, it's true it's not glib it's, it's true but you know right. I, I play jazz and uh um, i'm not uh, a jazz guitarist but i you know i enjoy playing it i love jazz um and uh you know the uh, plectrum guitar stuff I've done a lot of uh, that's not quite jazz I mean, they're composed pieces you learn them but they're, they've got jazz harmonies and so on and, and heritage behind it um, banjo I've done historical banjo that's stuff right. yeah <laughs> you know my my brother's a big uh, banjo fan and banjo player and when I posted that clip, he was like, oh, he texted me. He said, I love that guy. I just <laughs> checked out a bunch of his banjo videos. And, and yeah, so anyway, yeah, he, he appreciated uh, that. There's quite a few out there. I mean, I, I, again, I took the historical approach. Not many people were looking at that, and, but there are now. And uh, not just because of me, but because of others as well. Uh, so it's a, a growing area of interest. Um, how do I balance it all? Uh, well, I tend to work on projects. Um, a project for me might last three months and uh, it might uh, culminate in a, a book. I've had about 30 books published by Mel Bay. Um, uh, it, it might, in the older days, it would uh, lead to concerts or an album or something. And, uh, you know, an album would take longer than three months. You know, it'd take a year really to to research and and, and do. Um, but yeah, projects. And so if I say, well, I'm going to do a a banjo book, <laughs> um, uh, that would be my main focus for three months. Um, and then at the end of it, I put the banjo away, forget about it. I'm on to something else for three months. And uh, 
that is a way for me. I don't try and keep all the plates spinning at the same time. Uh, I'll let some of them fall off and uh, and then I'll replace them if they haven't smashed completely later. Um, and then they're ref- maybe refreshing when you come back. Yeah, to absolutely. Too, right? And you, you bring something else to it. You've, you've learned other things in the meantime and you can hear different things. Um, you know, it's it's... The main thing is trying to communicate on a human level with the composer, the guy or the woman who, who wrote the music you're playing. Um, was a living, breathing, might still be a living, breathing uh, human. And uh, they had all their stresses and strains of life, their joys, their fears, all this. And it comes out in their music. And um, you can... I always feel like I'm communicating with a, a composer yeah. and yeah. the audience is listening into this dialogue that we're having. And um, I think that's, it, it just seems a very human thing to do. Yeah. yeah. It's beautiful. Um, yeah. And it, that's what I aim for anyway. Did the project um, approach, was that just kind of naturally how, how it worked for you? Because when you got maybe inspired by something, it's all you were thinking about and you just wanted to go back to that? Or, or was that more of a conscious choice? You know, I want to do this in, in these kind of project phases because I'm compelled to see it through to some ver- some kind of level of completion or culmination or a combination of those. Yeah. I, um, uh, sometimes I would get a commission you know, and that, yeah. that's come from the outside and, um, you know, maybe Mel Bay wants a specific book or something and then I'll, I'll do that. Um, but most of the time the books are my ideas and, uh, you know, they're either going to take them or not, you know, and I just write the book and they'll take it. Um, CD-wise, uh, in the old days when we made CDs, um, you know, they would definitely be my ideas and what I wanted to do. And, uh, you know, a 60 minute recording is, is a great, uh, you know, uh, sort of unit <laughs> that would yeah. uh, encompass uh, a lot of what I was feeling about a certain composer or repertoire. Um, mm-hmm. Nowadays, I don't do CDs. Uh, I, I, I have a SoundCloud page, there's some stuff there. In fact, there's about six yeah. hours of stuff there. <laughs> Um, awesome. Yeah, so I, yeah, I, a lot of the time is is this is what I want to do. I take an interest yeah. in something and I follow it through, and it's got an end point, and it's yes. important it's got an end point because that frees me to then move on to something else. Super important, and that kind of comes back to the point we made earlier. Um, I do find that a lot of students, a lot of people working at at, on the guitar because they're practicing now when you get to the point of you're working on it to to do a performance or a recording or you know you feel like you're really expressing something I feel like it's easier to take on this project approach and get to an endpoint. but for the student that is practicing you know to get better which is the initial kind of phase of, of practicing I feel like a lot of students um, do have this feeling of I need to be practicing my scales and I need to be practicing this and I need to be doing this and I need to be rotating between them all evenly. I'm going to practice five minutes of this or whatever. I, th- I think this project approach is potentially applicable for anyone in any phase. What do you think? Absolutely. Beginners, you know, it's, it could be a chapter of a book or something. It's just, uh, or, you know, we have exam system syllabus here and uh, some people like it depends on the person. Some people like that and they ask me for it. Uh, it's never something I offer because I hate exams. You know? <laughs> yeah. uh, it's yeah. just not me at all. Um, yeah. uh, but you know, some people need that. It's, it's a, it's a, a yeah. foot, you know, so it will tell them how well they're doing. The problem is I've met with, we have a, an eight level grade system in the UK. And uh, when they reach grade eight, the ultimate level, uh, I've known people to give up because there's no grade nine, and they're so conditioned to doing exams, you know, that when they take away the exam, they just stop. I just can't believe yeah. it. You know, what, yeah, what have you been like doing? <laughs> yeah. Right. It's it's not uh, compelling people to be the student for life as opposed to the. Student. No, you got to fall in love with music and let that be your guide, not some exam system. Um, 
really it's it's so important that you you love every note you're playing on the guitar yeah. and if you don't love the notes you're playing why play them you know it's just, it's <laughs> what about for though because there are i think there are the phases where we don't love the notes we're playing but we we absolutely know we we have the potential for that you know Jeez. that perseverance That's is important. Yeah, it's important to to because it's it's not always gonna you know I didn't love the way it sounded when I switched <laughs> to without my nails didn't love it at all definitely my own playing drives me crazy but the thing is I've I've given up seeking perfection this is an yeah. important thing you know a lot of the pedagogy is is guided toward geared towards perfection like your machine yeah. you know <laughs> yeah. and that's why uh, they all sound the same yeah and um, you know I just don't want to uh, in, in fact, things that sound or look perfect, there's something wrong with them. You know, it just it's just not right. Um, so I, I prefer uh, people with a little bit of imperfection in them. Of course, you can have too much imperfection, but yeah. <laughs> but don't be scared of uh, not being perfect. You know, absolutely. You know, I just and and I was just uh, someone recommended a guitarist. Uh, that I'm sure you will know the name of because uh, because she supposedly was a no nail player, uh, Renata Tarago. If I'm, I'm sure I'm bu butchering the name, but anyway, I started listening to her discography and um, really enjoying it, and and a, a lot of imperfection in a beautiful way compared to the per the like meticulously produced recordings nowadays. I was at, I was just surprised by how uh, moving I found it to be you know really felt like there was a personality in there I don't like uh, uh, the way things are recorded now the digital perfection you know yeah. and uh, it's it just doesn't seem right I prefer the older recordings where things are not absolutely perfect but they're more human and I think yes. I keep coming back to this we need more humanity in our music, you know, yeah. this, the human element it, it just seems to be uh, drifting off a bit. Uh, yeah. we've, we've lost our yeah. compass there. Um, so, yeah, I think that's uh, one of my main guiding things. It's Yeah, and I think I think it comes through in your music in, in a, just a wonderful way. Um, selfish question regarding recording. You told you talked. I asked you before about what you used to record, and and you also. I just love that you're you're not so hung up about it. You kind of get a sound that's good, you know, that works for you, and you you're using a Rode kind of X Y pattern mic, and and just put it, you know, where you find that it sounds good. Do you add any reverb to it at all? I haven't listened closely enough to. I haven't like in this listened for like is there reverb there? Because obviously it sounds very natural. Do you or or, or not? Well, I add uh, so much to a point where if I hear it, I dial it back. Yes, you know, right. And that's why it's not obvious, and that's a yeah. good thing. Yeah. And I think that gives a tiny little bit of compression to what you're doing, um, which uh, you know, because microphones can be too aggressive in how they listen sometimes. <laughs> right. And and also, if if we were re if we were recording in a room that just sounded great on its own, we wouldn't need it. Add that. Yeah, you wouldn't need it. So yeah, you need a little something. But uh, yeah. if I start hearing, if I'm some of my older recordings where I didn't really know what I was doing or, or caked in in reverb, <laughs> it's just awful. But um, if you hear it, then it's too much. Right. No, that's that's a great uh, guide to go by. If you hear it too much, bring it up to where you, to where you hear it, then bring it back down. Yeah. Yeah. That's very good. Um, of course we could talk for, you know, I could talk to you all day. I could, I could pretend that this recording didn't work too. So to just to hang out with you again, but, um, if we could at the end here, just, uh, maybe mention that just your thoughts on tremolo, because that's the question everybody asks about, asks about, and you have some, some great thoughts on that. And then the other thing I was going to say, oh, I can't remember now if I think of it, I'll ask or, or not, but maybe just your thoughts on tremolo. Okay. Well, I'm already mentioned Tariga, you know, played tremolo yeah. without nails to great success. So it can be done. There was a there was a competition on Sky TV uh, in the UK at least um, uh, for guitar uh, classical guitars one, and he was playing Recuerdos de la Alhambra uh, without nails, and uh, part of this uh, uh, show was that they they had a master class with some respected player I won't mention who it is, who said you'll never be able to play guitar without nails you just can't play it. 
and the guy who played so well, he won the entire competition. So it can be done. Uh, I don't practice uh, tremolo um, because I, I don't play those pieces. Um, uh, so. I'm just making stuff up because I can't remember pieces. Now, we have to, uh, well, I vaguely remember the beginning of uh, required us. That's about all I remember. Now, no, it's, it's, it's not that great, but the because um, I don't practice it, you know, it's just yeah. not part of something I do. But we have to come up. Well, we come up against people's expectations of what a tremolo should be, uh, and we're used to a nail tremolo, which is machine gun like to a degree, and um, yeah. that's become that's come to define tremolo. But Pujol, who you know studied with Tarraga, uh said the tremolo should be ethereal. It just floating just in the background is is not a prominent thing um, so we we should expect no nails tremolo to be different from nail tremolo mm -hmm. and don't complain if it doesn't sound like nail tremolo and mm -hmm. people say to me if you can't play tremolo the entire technique you're using is is you know useless you should throw it out and I said, well, when I played with nails, I couldn't play tremolo. Does that mean that nail playing is useless as well? And, you know, just by their logic. So, no, uh, there are tremolo players, as we know. Some people who just have an exquisite tremolo and others who struggle a bit. I'm one of those who struggled, but I struggled when I had nails as well. So don't judge, trem uh, don't judge no nails technique on my tremolo. <laughs> And don't judge guitar playing on whether someone's guitar playing on whether or not they do tremolo or yeah yeah or, it's yeah. ludicrous yeah uh, you'd have yeah. to throw out everything I've ever done you know there's five hundred <laughs> videos there so yeah which yeah which obviously it would be a horrible loss because you have some great recordings out there and and they're just lovely all your videos you have stuff that's actually out on all the kind of you know, streaming platforms and Spotify and stuff like that there's a romantic era. Or a Spanish guitar album that's uh, solo guitar, lovely, and then you have SoundCloud stuff, and everybody should go check check it out, listen to it, and then rmclassicalguitar.com is your website where you have years and years and years of of uh, articles and writings, especially I think that site was you made it dedicated for for, for no nail playing. Yeah, for classical guitar, my classical guitar playing and discussing no nails and encouraging people to to do it if they feel like it. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's been obviously a huge influence on me and, and su super helpful. You know, I I, I tried this um, I, a few years into after starting classical guitar and um, gave up on it because there was, yeah, I, probably, I should have searched online and maybe would have found you at that time. But also I was in college and, and my professor was kind of, he was very open-minded and he was like, sure, give it a try with this kind of like, you'll be back kind of attitude. Like it's not going to work for you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I was in college, it just, I didn't have the time to uh, adjust before I had to do a recital or something like that. So, but you know, now I'm, now I'm back and, and, uh, and like, and just, I'm grateful for what you've done and what you've put out there and, and very grateful for hanging out with me and, and talking and, and I know you've been an influence on a, on a lot of people. So, uh, well, yeah. I'm sure you are too. Yeah. So I, I keep checking out your videos, and uh, yeah, your your students and uh, the people who follow you are lucky. You know, you got some great stuff there. So keep it up. That's very kind. Thank you. Thank you very much. And and like we said before, we we have such different approaches. You know, we're we're like, I, I love I love it, and I appreciate it. I have I have a particular I don't know, YouTube style, and then also teaching style, and where I'm a little more like. Um, I'm going to practice whether I feel like it or not kind of thing. And, and I'm going to try to, and, and you're so, you know, I'm going to practice when the music calls me and it's just, it's just beautiful, you know, and, and just another, you know, everyone can, f you can find your own way, you know, and be, be your own version of music. Well, that's it. You don't have to follow you know, a prototype. You don't have to follow anyone. Yeah. You know, don't follow me for, you know, just really don't follow me. Follow yourself, find your own voice and let that be your guide. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. So thank you so much again, and especially for, for just being so understanding and, and generous with talking for <laughs> a whole nother hour after we did it once before. So uh, I'm so grateful, and, and it's just wonderful to, to get to connect with you. So, okay. So thanks. It. Yeah, thanks again, and, and I'm sure we'll we'll be in touch, and, and I'll be checking out your videos and whatnot. So no, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. It's awesome that you are still here watching at the end of the interview. I'm considering reaching out to more guitarists, guitarists of all varieties and teachers and other guitarists on YouTube and sitting down and having conversations with them about what they think about when it comes to learning and practicing and teaching and music and being an artist and finding your path. If that sounds interesting to you, just let me know in the comments. That would be awesome. I would do that separate from my weekly Tuesday videos and uh, just something I'm thinking about. So I wanted to ask you and see if you'd find that interesting. Could start a podcast on it or something like that. I appreciate Rob joining me for this and I appreciate you watching and being a part of this community as well. Until next time, I will be back with another video, a lesson video next Tuesday again. See you then. Thanks so much. Take care.